All right. I think we're going to get started, and I'm going to use this microphone because it's being recorded. Um, so that's the only reason why that's happening. So it's 6.33, so we value your time, and we appreciate you being here. So we're going to get going. Welcome. I'm so happy you guys decided to come here instead of being out in the nice weather. So obviously this topic is very important to you, as it is to us as well. Um, for those of you who have never been here before, my name is Maggie Kuriakos, and I'm one of the senior advisors over at Bridges by Epic at Westwood. I'm here with my colleague, Pete Bruce, and this event is being co-sponsored with Bridges and Debbie Higgins. Debbie Higgins is with Cornerstone Caregiving. Don't uh, get confused um, by Cornerstone Assisted Living. <laughs> Do you want to say a couple words about Cornerstone? All right. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. And nice to see a lot of uh, familiar faces again. Um, Cornerstone Caregiving is a nationwide non-medical home companion care. We're based out of Norwood. We do um, treat clients or help care for clients with Alzheimer's and dementia. I have a lot of CNAs, certified nursing assistants, home health aides, PCAs, and experienced people with dementia and Alzheimer's. And I'm right next door in Norwood, um, and I just enjoy our, my partnership with these guys. So hope we can help you with some information. Thank you. Um, I also, Abby is not here, but I, we want to uh, thank um, Westwood Public Library for giving us a space to talk to you guys about this very important issue. Um, so we're really excited. This is actually our third um, part of our four-part lecture series. So um, we had one in January and one in February. At a show of hands, who has been here uh, January and February? Ah, okay, that's not bad, very good, very good. So welcome back, nice to see you again. And has anyone been here before? One, two, a few, okay. All right, and last question, who is completely new to this? Okay, awesome, all right, it's, all right we've got a good, a, we have a good mix of different, different people. I just um, wanna give you a little bit of background on Bridges, who we are, and why we do what we do. So Bridges by Epic at Westwood is a memory care, all-inclusive assisted living community, and we are located right on University Ave in Westwood. Um, our owner is Epic Senior Living, and I didn't mention this in the other, other few, but Epic is also uh, owns independent and assisted living communities um, they are known as Waterstone. So I don't know if you all have heard about Waterstone before. Um, and we're in Massachusetts, um, Connecticut, and New York. But anytime you hear about Bridges by Epic, we are completely memory care. So we are uh, all inclusive. We care for individuals um, in our communities in all stages of dementia. So from beginning, middle, all, all the way to end stage um, and late stage dementia. Um, we're really happy and excited about our um, community. We've been there since 2015. Um, we love working with our residents. We love working with our families. Um, we really are an extended family to our residents' families. Um, and if you guys are in the Westwood area, if you're shopping at Marshall's or Wegmans or Target um, or out to eat and, um, and you're nearby, I definitely encourage you to stop by and visit Pete um, and myself or, or myself um, and come see what we do because it's um, really a great place and we're excited to show it off and show, all our, um, show you our happy residents and our happy staff. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Pete Bruce. Pete is my colleague, uh, the second senior advisor, uh, my partner in crime at Bridges, and he's a certified dementia practitioner. So he's going to be the one doing the program on effective communication. Pete. <laughs> Thanks, Maggie. Um, Maggie said I am the second senior advisor. That is true. She's number one. Um, Maggie and I have been working together for, for some time. And um, you know the, the great thing about our community is we do get to come out and do this. This is actually the highlight of our day. Um, not to be in, even though there's a lot of laughter, believe it or not, that goes on at our community. Uh, you know, this is really where it happens. The most important people in this room right now are all of you. Uh, how many of you are here uh, as caregivers? Okay, great. 
And how many of you are here just for education, lifelong learner, interesting, oh, great, great. And how many of you, I've said this joke a number of times, how many of you are here for the food? Uh, it's not this, actually, it's interesting. I've never had a lint chocolate that's Neapolitan. So that was pretty, that's, again, number one to Maggie. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about effective communication. But I, I guess, probably, that you all are probably doing a lot of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. If you're a caregiver or if you know someone who is struggling with uh, dementia um, and living with this disease, um, it can be difficult. I'm just going to go through these real quick. These are just some pictures of our, um, of our community. But uh, you probably are doing things naturally <clears throat> already. Um, you know, uh, today, though, we're going to talk about some not as many uh, don'ts <clears throat> as do's. Because if you're doing the do's, you don't have time to do the don'ts, OK? Uh, it is important, though, to remember one thing is um, if you're a caregiver, you uh, have to take care of yourself, too. Don't ever forget that. And it can be very lonely. You know, they talk about from the Alzheimer's Association, they, uh, they talk about, you know, if you're going around, uh, along a road, every seventh or sixth mailbox, there's someone living with dementia or, or being cared. Um, that's how, kind of one of the statistics. It's very prevalent. You're hearing more and more about it. But still, a lot of people, you know, um, are trying to do it all by themselves. And we're here to support you all. Um, one of our, our missions that we do in our, um, at our community and for our, our company is to educate. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about effective communication. And then we're going to open it up for a chance for you to ask questions. If we don't have the answer, we're going to get you the answer. Um, we're not doctors, obviously. Um, and we may have to refer to you to various specialists or, or whatnot for a, for a uh, question that you might have, but we'll do do our best to answer it. Sometimes there's a curveball that comes up that we have to uh, say, ah, let's parking lot this. If you do have a question, um, raise your hand during this presentation if you you know so that you don't um, feel like you have to wait till the end. If we can't answer it right away, we'll we'll talk to you afterwards. There'll be some time afterwards. So the importance of communication, right? So we. It's a way for us to basically communicate our needs, our wishes, our feelings. That's what it's all about. And so we're going to frame this in the idea of dementia, folks that are living with this disease. Um, I like to talk about you know, how, how things are processed in our brain, not to get technical, but um, it's kind of like a file cabinet. If you've been to these talks before, I've talked about how we retain information, how we retrieve information, whether it is remembering somebody's name or how to get to the grocery store or um, you know, how to make chicken soup from scratch. It doesn't matter what it is. We're, we learn information and then we retain it. Either it's going to be long term or it's going to be short term, depending on the time and how often we are using that information. Some information just comes in and goes out. Other stuff, which we, you know, for example, I bet all of you probably can remember your telephone number from when you were growing up. It's pretty, probably because you did it many, many, many times. You used that number. Then there are things like, you know, going on a trip or something like that. And there may be uh, things that you remember and things that you don't remember. And that is completely normal. One of our presentations, our first presentation we did, for those who are here would remember, it was about um, uh, is it normal aging or memory loss? Our second talk was about the stages of dementia specifically. Now this is the third uh, part. And it's more um, kind of just knowing some uh, tips and tricks to use when you're working as a caregiver or as just a friend. It also helps to maintain a quality of life, but also preserves our sense of identity. Communication does that. And it's more than just talking. 
right? So there's other ways that we draw in information and we make sense of the world. Communication consists of more of talking. Large portion is nonverbal. And when somebody has dementia and they're having more difficulty communicating their needs through verbal, they're, they're trying to pick up um, certain cues, nonverbal cues. And so as caregivers and folks who have loved ones uh, who have uh, issues around being able to speak, you know, uh, the technical term is aphasia, they'll rely on these other, uh, other things, okay? So nonverbal includes gestures, facial expressions, touch. Certainly, we were at a challenge at our community. Can you imagine being at a community where during the pandemic, everybody was required to wear masks? We actually still wear masks, um, the, the uh, staff does. But communicating without the ability of facial fe features it was challenging. Um, facial expressions in touch. Touch is a very important part um, of connecting to other people. Nonverbal communication is especially important for those with dementia and can also explain uh, certain behaviors as well. What happens when someone is affected by, um, uh, by when I say dementia or Alzheimer's, I'm gonna use that kind of uh, generally and universally because um, most of the types of the most prevalent dementia is Alzheimer's. So if I go back and forth uh, with that term, it's only for, um, it's only to keep it general. Damage, it damages the pathways in the brain, which makes it difficult to find the right words. It's usually in the, temp, uh, in the, in the front, frontal. So it slowly er erodes verbal uh, communication skills. It may happen over a long period of time. Your loved one's words and expressions may start to make little or no sense. It might be what we term a word salad, or it might be a whole bunch of different uh, words, maybe every other word uh, might be a key to figuring out what it is that they're trying to say. Changes in communication using familiar words uh, repeatedly over and over. Inverting new words to describe familiar objects. Easily losing his or her train of thought, so um, there can be patterns of thought that are interrupted. Sometimes, uh, for folks that are, uh, have a native language other than English, folks will revert back to their native language. We just had a gentleman move into our community, and uh, he was from Puerto Rico, but his native language was uh, Czech. But he spoke many, many different languages, including English, very fluently early on in his life, but then reverted back to his uh, native language. Some other changes in communication, having difficulty organizing words logically, kind of that word salad. Um, speaking less often. This kind of goes along with folks, especially in the early stages when they realize that there are some changes happening to them and they'll, um, they'll draw back from social uh, situations because it's too difficult. If you can think of the retrieval, if someone's trying to retrieve Im information all day long and they're putting a lot more effort into that, they can be exhausted towards the end of the day and a lot more confusion. And this goes along with also our, our ability to, to speak as well. Needing more time to understand uh, what you're saying. So that processing issue again, kind of the retrieval and the file cabinet in your brain. Open it up, pull out the information you need and utilize it. It might take a little bit longer. Certain times of day, I've had folks say, boy, there's this sweet spot between uh, nine o'clock and noon that they're just right on and they can remember things and they can communicate but then, psh, after lunch, forget about it. It gets much more difficult, more challenging. Sometimes, and it's dependent on the type of dementia as well, 
Um, there can be cursing and use of obscene language. Someone who has never had that issue before can all of a sudden, it's almost like the, um, the filter has come off and that can happen. But not necessarily just for that reason. It also can be for frustration reasons. There may be no issue or, or around you know, the, the specific type of dementia. It might be just that they're frustrated. And you know, the reality is some people use obscene language you know, when people are frustrated. In the early stages, you know, um, it's important as, as caregivers to not to make assumptions about their ability to communicate. Again, it kind of goes back to times of day, um, the stage that they might be in. Don't make assumptions that they're not able to understand. Sometimes it's easy as a caregiver to just go ahead and just get it done. But sometimes for dignity reasons, it can, it can have just the opposite effect, so slowing down. You're gonna hear, you know, um, uh, some people say that if in a presentation, you know, if you hear something over and over, it's, it's probably important, right? So um, one of the things that it's important is to slow down. Don't exclude um, them from conversations, especially like, for example, um, when you go to a doctor's office with uh, your loved one, this happens a lot, and the doctor will talk to the caregiver and not to the patient. It's okay to say, can you talk to my mom, or can you talk to my uncle, or can you talk to my wife? Tell that to the doctor. Include them, especially in the early stages. And even in the later stages, when someone has lost the ability to talk, um, they still feel, <laughs> they still feel that's something that you don't, if anything, dementia, folks with who have dementia, feel more, they feel more. So it's important for us to, um, to take our time to listen, to wait, to include. Speak directly to them if you want to know how they're doing. Ask them, sometimes they can, they can answer. Sometimes they can't. Sometimes when I'm at work and I go up to someone who has aphasia, I say, are you okay? And, and wait and see if I can read what they're giving me back. Sometimes it's, uh, you can have a picture, uh, a whole bunch of pictures. You know, if, they, if someone has lost their ability to, um, to ask for something, perhaps they can try to identify through a different way. So maybe it's uh, some picture of clothes or maybe it's pictures of food that they like or maybe it's a, a picture of a glass of water, or, or whatever it is. Maybe having some flashcards. That sometimes works with some folks. Take time to listen to how they are feeling and what they're thinking, um, and are thinking or what they may need. Sometimes when folks are getting uh, frustrated, uh, they're upset, uh, that there may be some behaviors that go along with, with, um, uh, with any part of their day. It may be an unmet need. So getting to know what that unmet need is if it's happening at the, uh, at the same time during the day. Maybe they're hungry, maybe they're angry, maybe they're lonely, maybe they're tired. Maybe they have a, uh, a sore on their foot. Maybe they need to go to the bathroom. Maybe they've already gone to the bathroom. These are all things that we need to uh, keep, in, keep in mind. Again, give them time to respond. So if I ask a question, how are you today, Maggie? Okay. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's 10 times as long as that, right? Sometimes it just takes time. Don't interrupt or finish sentences until uh, they ask for help. Think, just think about you know, um, how it might be for you. If you're, if you're asking a, a question and you're going to respond and then you get another question, it can be frustrating. Again, folks that have dementia probably feel more. Talk with them about what they are still comfortable doing. 
So trying to find their comfort zone and, and entering, it's very important to enter their world and their reality as opposed to our reality. Our reality is it could be that we have to go do a whole bunch of things like go do the laundry, take someone to, to a senior center, go over and do some grocery shopping and our days are packed. Um, but thinking about entering their world, they're trying to manage where their reality is. And their reality might not be the same reality. Their reality might be 1987. So we sometimes can ask, what year is it? Sometimes I've asked that. What year is it? And they say 1987 or 1962. So I might say, okay, I need to think, what is it, 1962? Or they may even give you another clue and to say, I need to go to work, I need to go to work, right? That happens a lot. I need to go somewhere, I need to go to work, I need to go pick up the children from school. And obviously their children are um, older adults now. So instead of saying, no, your children are adults, that's not true. You don't have to go to school anymore. Say, yeah, what school do they go to? Where do they go to school? What, what grade are they in? What grade are they in, not what grade were they in, right? So entering their world. Don't be, a, don't be afraid to enter that world, even though the, it's counterintuitive to think we need to base them back into reality, right? That's counterintuitive to say, let's enter their world and say, oh, they have to go pick up their, or they have to be picked up by their, their father. They're gonna be getting, uh, getting out of school soon. That's what a person with dementia might be thinking. But in fact, you know, this is a progressive disease. If we think we're going to bring them back to reality every day, that's not, that's not the truth. This is a progressive, fatal disease. Unfortunately, you have to say that. Um, but on the bright side, uh, they're still with, with us. So it's important to stay um, as present for ourselves of what we have to do, but it's not as important for us to, be, uh, to have them be present where we're at. Another um, problem sometimes families have is that their loved one with dementia is out of state. Does anybody have a situation like that? One, okay. And wh what do you do? How do you communicate? What's the, is that okay to ask you? Okay. <laughs> After you finish your Neapolitan, I'll come back to you. Very true. The computer can be difficult. Sometimes email is the best way. Sometimes, not all the time, but I don't know if anybody ever uses FaceTime or Zoom. I've done that. Sometimes it can be, it can be confusing for folks because of um, it's not face-to-face, -face, right? But sometimes email works well. Um, sometimes folks using the phone doesn't work well for various reasons. Not only just because of dementia, but sometimes folks have issues about hearing. So even that can be, you know, it can be multi-level multi when you're talking about communication. There may be some um, other medical modalities that are um, affecting communication. By the way, it's okay to laugh once in a while. It's okay. Um, this, is a, this is a crummy disease. Um, but I will tell you, when Maggie and I are, uh, are at work at Bridges, we can walk through any of our community and there's always an opportunity to laugh and to joke and to have a, a good time. We were talking earlier today, we have um, dining, a dining area at our, uh, at our community. And so folks, you know, come out of their apartments, they come over to our, uh, to see it, sit and our, our chefs uh, will, will prepare the meals and, and we have dignity in, in dining. So we, show, we show two show plates. Which would you like? So we still have some dignity of choice. Two show plates for folks that have aphasia and can't speak. And, uh, and they're able to point if they can't say what they want. So that's you know, dignity in dining, giving folks still choice. 
uh, where I was going though with the laughter part is there was a woman who was eating and this other woman had her eyes closed like this and she's like, oh, do you remember what we were talking about earlier? Like, oh, oh, and we thought she was in pain. And then all suddenly this big <laughs> and the woman right next to her says, what did she say? She said, um, I hear you, and everybody laughed. It was kind of like uh, um, what a mother would say, you know? And so we just kind of go with that. Um, be honest with your, oh, be honest with your, uh, about your feelings and don't pull away. This can be difficult. Um, you know, uh, if you're having difficulty as a, as a caregiver, um, I had a woman who came in and she said, um, I've had it. I've had it with my husband. I can't take it anymore. I'm going to strangle him if I have to do one more thing for him. He's following me around all over the you know what house. And I said, um, hey, do you have a bathroom? She said, yeah, I have a bathroom. I said, what I want you to do is go into your bathroom, lock the door, put some music on with your cell phone, and just chill. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. Take five minutes to you for yourself. Take five minutes for yourself. As we talked about um, cues, um, nonverbal cues, right? So f folks, with folks with dementia can see when we're frustrated, you know? If we're standing over someone or if we have our arms crossed like this, right? If we have our arms crossed, if we're standing, you know, t with our back to someone, well, that's not going to help anybody to commu communicate too well. Um, the best things that we do as, uh, when we educate with our uh, staff is I say to folks, um, are you wearing your uniform today? And they're like, yeah, Pete, I'm wearing my uniform today. And I said, no, 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 I'm not talking about your shirt. I'm not talking about your pants. I'm not talking about your shoes. I don't care about that. You can't come with this. You come with this. When you show up to work, you should be smiling. Because the smile tells me right away, I, I smiled, and guess what I saw? I saw half of you smile too. I saw half of you smile too. Because when we communicate that way, it's almost impossible in early dementia to go ahead and not have that reaction. When you make eye contact with, with someone and you actually are focused in on that one person, you've connected. You've connected. And so, you know, it's important to also, when you're approaching someone, and this happens all the time too, so I'll, I'll go up to a, a resident who I've known for three and a half years, and I'll come up and I can see the look on their eye. I can see the look. I'm coming towards them and I'm smiling. I've got these big open arms. I'm like, how you doing today? And they're saying, oh no, who is this? I, I think I know him, but I'm not for sure. Yep, so you know the six, six foot rule and all of that, what we would do is we, uh, on occasions we'd pull down our masks so we could smile so that they'd know. Most importantly, and folks got used to it, actually it was amazing that folks did get used to having the mask up. Um, what really was hard is the folks that were at home who had nobody around, just the physical proximity to having other people around uh, was more important. We had a we saw a very high up uptick of you know when the senior centers were closed and whatnot and people were kind of homebound and whatnot we saw that the dementia increased because folks just weren't even around other people and so that was important but the masks weren't actually as hard to deal with even though I said earlier about the masks it's it's basically the facial part so what I would do and I know Maggie would do it too and and even at, in the home for with Deb is the human touch you know you might have the mask on but you could touch you could put a hand a gentle hand on someone's back rub their back talk you know that was important the eyes exactly um, lots of things could be done but when I would when I walk up to someone and they're not familiar 
with, you know, even though I've known them for three and a half years, I'll go up to them and say, hey, it's great to see you, Maggie. It's Pete. It's Pete. So giving them a little clue as to who is this guy coming towards me. If you go to a, and we do these um, other presentations, there's one coming up called um, Happy Trails will be coming up in another location. And it's for, it's for tr um, summer travel. And um, what, uh, one of the things that we do is incorporate um, holidays, summer travel, and when families visit, so like during holidays and things like that, um, we offer a program on some, um, some things to, do, to talk about with when uh, Uncle Joe comes to visit and he has dementia, what should you do? And so if you're interested in inf some information like that, either come to our presentation or shoot us an email or um, just ask, you know, and I can send you the presentation. By the way, any of these presentations that we do, uh, there was a sign up in the back. We don't use any of this information except to contact you if you want us to send you the presentation. If you tell us, hey, I don't want to be um, contacted at all. I just wanted to get some information and just thank you very much. Don't don't contact me. That's no problem at all. Uh, but the, pre the presentations that we offer that I'm talking about, that we've done already, or the ones that we do do, um, we can send to you. Yes? Um, how does five minutes in the bathroom help the lady with her husband if she knows she's going to follow her as soon as she opens her door? Yeah. Gave her, a bit of, uh, gave her a little break. And you know what she did? Her name was Pam. Um, I actually worked with her up in Andover, Massachusetts. And she said, uh, you know what? That's all I needed to get through that moment. She didn't do it much, because he was a wanderer, right? Uh, he liked to wander around the house. He didn't yet go out into the, into the community, right? But it, for that moment, that moment, she was able to have the break that she needed. She needed that break. Um, what else? And it's also situational. You know, I wouldn't be asking people if there's a history of, you know, someone who is found down, you know, on Route 95 wandering. That wouldn't be the right appro approach. But for that pr particular person, it worked because it gave that caregiver the moment that they needed the break. So a lot of times caregivers don't, think that they can do this, um, but they don't know where to turn either and to allow themselves a break. Explore which method of, oh, we talked about this already, okay. So here's some other tips. Speak slowly and clearly. Show respect. We've kind of already talked about some of these. Stay present. When I say stay present, stay present with them, but they don't have to stay present. They can go all over the place. They can go to Mars if they want to. It doesn't matter. Uh, avoid distraction. So sometimes effective communication, if, there's, if folks are in, overstimulated, this is kind of goes back to the whole Uncle Joe is going to be visiting thing. Um, I'll just give you a quick little tip. What I tell folks, if you're going if you definitely are going with, on a, to a party, um, have a place for Uncle Joe um, where he can retire to, to have a little break, you know, a, a place where he can take a nap. Or, you know, if there's going to be a lot of kids or a lot of music going on, you know, try to limit it to a certain area of the, of the house. At least have a spot where someone can retire. If there's a lot of, um, if there's a lot of different stimulation people je uh, laughing and joking over here and there's music going on over here and there's a there's the football game on over here and um you know who knows what else is going on that can be very overstimulating uh for the person with dementia so reducing that is is key if you're a caregiver uh, you don't want to have music going on and a television and then trying to give uh, someone directions on, okay, the first thing I need you to do is to go into the bathroom, br wash your, uh, brush your teeth, put your shoes on. We're going to be out going outside in about five minutes, so be ready because we got to go to that doctor. Remember, we have that doctor appointment that's coming up. Too much information, so 
slow it down, take a moment, one direction. And it all depends, too, on the, the stage of, of dementia. You know, folks in the early stages can, can manage it. Folks in the middle stages, uh, not so much. And that's usually where aphasia, the, uh, the, the verbal communication, is affected in, this, in the middle stages. Uh, <clears throat> again, pause. Um, stay in the pause. When someone, uh, when you ask a question, you know, um, pause. Use visual cues is another really important thing. So, for example, um, you know, I, I might say, do, do we need to go? Do we need to go? Is it almost time? Is it almost 5 o'clock? And that might make them look at the clock. Or you might point to the clock. Okay, it's 7 o'clock. Don't argue. That's all it does. The probably the if you don't come away with anything else besides having a smile on your face, the other thing is don't argue. Never say to a person who has dementia, and I'm going to give you a caveat ever after this. Don't ever say no. Don't ever say no, except if there's a safety issue. You know, it doesn't work. It doesn't help to to argue if they're arguing about you know being a child. If they're arguing about going to take care of children. Oh, if they need to go to work, if, uh, if there is, you know, at 7 o'clock, they're going to show uh, the man on the moon, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's fine. Because the thing about dementia is usually give it some time and folks are probably going to be on to something else. Sometimes those times can feel endless. But don't argue. Accept if there's a safety concern, obviously. Stay calm. Um, body language, again, is key. You know, my, my demeanor right now is just easy going. Okay, that's fine. You know, um, if I get an argument at work and I, I say, oh, do you want to uh, do you wanna go to an activity? We've got a great uh, entertainer coming up. And they say, absolutely not. Absol hey, no problem, your choice. If you want to do that, walk away, you know. And then somebody else comes along, maybe it's me too, comes back. Hey, you want to go to the entertainment? Sure. Okay. It happens all the time. Um, or maybe it's somebody else. And, you know, what they say about, you know, that whole mailbox thing, you know, that there's six, or, uh, you know, every six or seven mailbox, um, there's someone with dementia. Well, behind that person who has dementia, usually there's three or four people, you know, trying to support whether it's a friend or a family or whatnot. So um, sometimes it's taking shifts. You know, uh, other people are taking shifts uh, to help manage, uh, manage things like this. There's some great supports that are available. Uh, Deb does Cornerstone, ho uh, Cornerstone Home Care. We have Bridges. There's the Senior Center. Um, they have social workers there, HESCO. Um, can be supportive as well. There are even restaurants that are dementia friendly restaurants where they keep um, they they keep uh, the distractions low for folks who want to go out and have a nice meal out with their spouse or with their family. These are all things that are are supports. Um, I already kind of demonstrated the whole identifying yourself. Call the person by name. Sometimes words can be um, difficult, even words that you've used uh, as um, words of affection, you know, like honey or darling or uh, sugar babe. <laughs> I don't know. Any of these, any of these can be kind of confusing to, to folks um, if they're having word finding issues and processing issues. Okay, so um, using their name is very important. If they say that you are their brother or their sister and you're actually their spouse, go with it. Go with it. There may be other times of the day that you are who you, know, who you actually are, but other times is go with the flow. Um, go with the flow, bend with the wind. Uh, use short, 
simple words and sentences. Let's go. It doesn't have to be let's go with a frown. Just let's go and wait. Or it's walk with me. And sometimes it's, you know, hey, let's go. Okay? Right? So human touch, demonstrate what, what needs to be done. Patiently wait for a response. Repeat information or questions as needed. That's not meaning rapid fire round, <laughs> okay? Take time, if they're not getting the process, try it again, slow it down. Turn a question into an answer. So, your uncle is coming tomorrow. And that helps them to remember. Your brother is coming tomorrow. We have a dinner date uh, tomorrow with the Joneses. Avoid confusing or vague statements, such as, you know, um, things that we may say. It's, you know, uh, it, it could be anything like, uh, I'm trying to think of something now. Um, it's as, it's as, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something. Anybody have an idea of what I, yeah? Who did you see today? What is that? Who did you see today? Yep. Yeah. Who did you see today? Um, what was for lunch? What was for lunch? <laughs> Give them a guess. That bologna sandwich was pretty good. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Turn negatives into positives. Ah. Ah, the negative into the positive. Does anybody have, uh, have to give someone with uh, their loved one a shower? That could be a tough one. That could be a tough one. Oh, if we just get this shower done, we get, to, we get to go to bed. You feel so good after you take a shower. Oh, it's going to be so relaxing. Oh, my goodness. Wow, it's like a spa. It's like a spa day. <laughs> when there might be a lot more having to do besides just showering, right? All right. Uh, avoid quizzing, you know. So rapid fire, asking them, oh, asking them, are, they, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? Are you all right? Hey, it's anxiety provoking for them. You know? And plus you're quizzing them. Who the heck wants to be quizzed all the day? I don't. Right, Maggie? I don't like to be told <laughs> what to do. <laughs> what to do. Uh, um, offer a guess. Offer a guess. Are, we, uh, are, the, are the Joneses coming over for dinner tomorrow night? Uh, if they say yes, great. If they don't, you know, it's a 50-50 anyways. And if it's not, yeah, that's fine. Just go with it. Go with it. Um, writing things down for some folks, you know, picture, cards, writing things down. Um, that's, that's a good way. It works for some people. Convey in easygoing manner. We talked about that as well. Um, the one thing, and I mentioned this at our, our last presentation, is um, there's nothing worse well, maybe there's a lot more worse, but something that is really hard for folks, it doesn't matter if they're, they have dementia or if uh, they don't have dementia, nobody likes to feel embarrassed. Nobody likes it. Calling them out on something, telling them that they're wrong, um, doesn't work too well. So, um, you know, there's always about dignity, about touch, Hey, we all make mistakes. You know, I have one, one uh, gentleman who was talking to his son all the time and he was afraid that he was making, now this is a guy who, um, who owned a huge company out of, out of country. And he'd go up to his son and he'd say, am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Did I do it okay? He's talking about brushing his teeth and putting on his pants, okay? 
So encouragement, just saying, yeah, it's fine. Okay, you spilled something, okay, all right, we're gonna get through this, we'll do this, we'll take care of it. I get it, it's easier said than done when it's in the, in the throes of everything, you know. But taking an easy approach, is gonna, you're gonna get more traction than taking uh, the approach of you know, frustration, body language, frown, um, screaming. It doesn't help, right? Easier said than done. Oh, and also, don't take it personally, right? Don't take it personally. Um, because the thing about it is that it's dementia. It's a disease. Um, we, you know, if someone has, if someone has um, heart disease or they're in the, they're in the um, hospital, right? Any of you nurses here? Anybody a nurse? Okay. So um, somebody goes into the hospital and they have a procedure done uh, for their heart. And uh, that person who has, um, who has the procedure done for their heart, they're appreciative of the help that they're getting, right? The aftercare by the nurse or the doctor. And they say, thank you so much. Thank you. That's great. You know, I, I'm in pain, but thank you for helping me out. Not so with the person who has dementia. They go into the hospital. Or they're a caregiver. They're getting help from their caregiver. Never, hardly ever, will you get a thank you. Never. A caregiver who is caregiving for someone with dementia hardly ever gets a thank you. They hardly will be told that, they're, that I love you. They will never hear, thanks for making me uh, that wonderful drink or that nice meal or thank you for cleaning up my mess that I left on the floor or changing my bed sheets. You will never hear that. That's why it's important to you know, get the support that you can get from a, um, from a venue similar to this. Uh, we offer support groups at Bridges, um, finding people that will listen who understand what you're talking about, um, getting yourself a, give yourself a break. These are all things that are important. Yes, in the back. All right, fantastic. Yeah. Ah, I love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. Yep. That's awesome. You, you're, what is your name? Mary. Mary, you're a million percent right. And I'm glad you called me on it in terms of, um, of what I said in a general term. I'm saying things in a lot of general terms, right? So not everything will work at every single time. It's a general thing. I will tell you this, guess what the most uh, predictable thing about dementia is? It's unpredictable. You never know. And all, you know, um, dementia, the signs and stages, we did this presentation uh, last month. And we talked about there are different types of dementia. And there are different ways that dementia is manifested. Uh, at our community, we have a lot of folks that are just like uh, your husband, who are, are happy, kind of pleasantly confused. They're in the early stages of dementia. Later stages can be a much more, it's a different story sometimes, sometimes. So I'm glad you pointed that out, Mary. You're right. And I think it's okay to tell little lies 
I agree. Yep. Yep. That's I. It's great, great. You know, we uh, we do another presentation called the ethics, the ethics of fibbing, which is basically you telling a little white lie. So if anybody is interested in getting that information, we can send you a presentation on that too. If if there's some people who say I really would like to know more about that, the ethics of fibbing. If you look up, <clears throat> even on the internet, therapeutic fiblets, it'll tell you kind of the reasons why, why we do. It's kind of, again, counterintuitive. I don't want to lie to my, my uh, loved one or whatnot, but it actually is meant, it's not, it's not for us, it's for them to reduce their stress because we know that there's a direct correlation between um, anxiety and depression and when dementia, you know, kind of goes off the chart. You know, it can happen at certain times of the day and certain types of cir circumstances too. So, um, I think the presentation is pretty much, pretty much done. Debbie is awesome. Debbie helps a lot of folks out in the community. There's also, if you're looking for a day program, give you a, a couple hours a, a week or whatnot, there's a great place up the, up the road called Julia Ruth House. It's a great place. Um, Mary? And my husband goes three days a week to that. There's no place like it. There's nothing. It's, no. it's a special place. We're going to be doing, is it next month? Yeah, it's going to actually be next month. Go ahead. So next, our last presentation is actually April 26th, Wednesday, 6.30 to 8, 8 o'clock. It's our finale. And we're going to do a panel presentation. So there's actually copies of the flyer out front there you can grab. But um, we're going to have an elder law attorney. Um, Debbie's going to um, be talking. Hesco Elder Services, Westwood Council on Aging, Julia from Julia Ruth House, and then, of course, us. Um, and it's um, entitled, Where Do I Begin? Coordinating Your Loved One's Care. So it's more kind of all-encompassing, which I think is going to be really beneficial to a lot of people. So you can grab that um, on your way out, too. Thanks, Maggie. Um, I came across something that somebody sent me about dementia uh, and their loved one. Um, what time is it? So we got plenty of time. That's good. Um, if you don't mind, I'm not actually being rude. I, was, I had it on my phone. And I was just going to read this real quick. It says, if I get dementia, this person wrote this as if they're writing to their family. And it kind of sums up kind of what we talked about tonight. And so it says, if I get dementia, if I get dementia, I'd like my family to hang this wish list up on the wall where I live. I want to remember these things. Here we go. One, if I get dementia, I want my friends and family to embrace my reality. Two, if I think my spouse is still alive or if I think we're visiting my parents or dinner, let me believe those things. I'll be much happier for it. Number three, if I get dementia, don't argue with me about what is true for me versus what is true for you. Number four, if I get dementia and I am not sure who you are, do not take it personally. My timeline is confusing to me. Number five, if I get dementia and can no longer use utensils, do not start feeding me. Instead, switch me to, finger food, to a finger food diet uh, and see if I can still feed myself. Number six, if I get dementia and I am sad or anxious, hold my hand and listen. Do not tell me that my feelings are unfounded. Number seven, if I get dementia, I don't want to be treated like a child. Talk to me like... I'm an adult, which I am. Number eight is, if I get dementia, I still want to enjoy the things I've always enjoyed. Help me find a way to exercise, read, and visit with friends. Number nine, if I get dementia, ask me to tell, uh, tell you a story from my past. Number 10, if I get dementia and I become agitated, take the time to figure out what it is that's bothering me. 11, if I get dementia, treat me the way that you would want to be treated. 12, if I get dementia, 
make sure that there are plenty of snacks for me in the house. Even, even now, if I don't eat them, don't eat, I get hungry, and if I have dementia, I may have trouble explaining what I need. That's gonna be me. Um, I always need snacks and candy, yes. 13, if I get dementia, don't talk to me as if I'm not in the room. 14, if I get dementia, don't feel guilty if you cannot care for me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not your fault and you've done your best. Find someone who can help you or choose a great new place for me to live. 15, if I get dementia and I live in a dementia care community, please visit me often. 16, if I get dementia, don't act frustrated. If I mix up names and events and places, take a deep breath, it's not my fault. 17, if I get dementia, make sure I always have my favorite music playing within earshot. 18, uh, pick up, uh, I like to pick up items and carry them around. Help me return those items to their original place. There's only three more, so don't worry. Okay, 19, if I get dementia, don't exclude me from parties and family gatherings. 20, know that I'm still like, uh, I still like receiving hugs and handshakes. Um, and then 21 is remember that I am still the person you know and love. That's it, that's it. So um, that's it. Um, we like to, thank the Westwood Library for Deb Higgins with Cornerstone. Um, we want to open this up to questions. We'll be here for a while. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. When you talk about not arguing, do you mean um, just say yes and do what you were going to do anyway? Hmm. Well, it could be situational. I th can you give me an example? Yeah, when I asked, for example, um, who has Alzheimer's, late, if she's declining, then lately when she comes to, say, my house or my uncle's house or whatever, within five minutes, she says, I want to go home. Hmm. <laughs> and she'll keep saying it. Yeah. Yep. So should he just say, no, we're not going home? Or should he, 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 he leaves, he takes her home? Yeah, so, um, it, so before it gets to the point of I want to go home, you know, so, the, the, so obviously the safe place for her is where? Home. When we know that transitions can be very difficult for anybody, so maybe, maybe, Bring the, bring the party to her, right? So try that, that could be one solution to it. But I do know that transitions can be hard. I think what, what he's trying to do is the right thing. Sometimes it works. It's not, sometimes you know, it's about having the tricks in the bag. Sometimes it's gonna work, sometimes it's not. I don't think it's wrong to do that. I think um, saying no can be counterproductive. Um, to say no, we're not going home. Uh, because if, if the safe places for her to have is home, you're denying her safety. So at some point, you know, give it some time. We're gonna go in about five minutes and yeah, it can be, you know, it can be annoying to have to say it 20 times, but sometimes that's what has to be done. But I think, Entering again into her world is probably the best thing, and, and probably taking her home is probably the best, um, best thing to do if it's repeatedly over and over and over. Obviously, there's an unmet need. She doesn't want to be out of the home. Um, that's what works for, for us at our community. I'm not making this an infomercial for our community, but we have all the services at our, at our place, nurses, doctors, podiatrists, all these things that you have to do for visits, you know, that to go out 
and do things. We have it all there. So um, it cuts down on the I have to go home because we're not removing folks from their home. So try bringing, having a, a group, a, a family visit over there as opposed to going out. That could be uh, difficult for the for your uncle because he probably wants to get out too. So, yeah, yeah. is that okay? The answer that way, you know, strategi strategize maybe reducing the uh, the I don't want to go I want to go home type of thing. Yeah, Mary. I, and and you know what I I believe Mary that you you do all that you do and you say it exactly the way you just said it in a very easygoing demeanor um, you know and it basically um, disarms your husband from for at least for a little bit <laughs> that's that's right that's right yep that's right ah. Uh, there's a couple things to say about that. Did everybody hear that? So uh, it's, what if they're already home? Then obviously it's not a safe place for them. They've gotten to a point where, where in their mind there's some other reason why it's not safe. It's a safe place. But in their mind, it's mostly there's an unmet need. So finding out what makes them, um, why they're not feeling secure there. So it could be, it could be that they're hungry, that they're angry, they're tired. They could be tired. They could be lonely. Maybe they want some people around. Um, it could be that they're stressed about something. What's that? Could be grief. It could be a uh, trauma that actually just happened. Um, I had a, I had a uh, a person that I was working with, and their loved one had just lost their their um, their wife and they couldn't be consoled they just couldn't be consoled they couldn't express that they lost their wife they didn't even know that they lost their wife but they knew that there's something was going on with the family and so um, sometimes it's it's acknowledging I understand you want to go home like Mary said like you said you know I want to go home okay okay is there anything, we can't do that right now, is there anything we can do to make this better? Sometimes when we're traveling, going back to this, um, to uh, one of the presentations that we do, which is um, safe travels in the summer or holidays, you know, um, making celebrations around holidays a, a good thing. Sometimes it's figuring out what are the things that we need to pack or have on hand that are going to comfort or distract or re um, redirect. I remember there was a woman that I was working with who, um, the, the, it was brilliant for this, this uh, daughter. She would, um, she knew that her mom loved tea in the afternoon. She was actually British. So she always thought this, it just made me think of this, this, uh, this woman would always say the same thing. I gotta go home, I gotta go home, it would never stop. The daughter's there. She actually um, went down to a part-time job because she, you know, she had a full-time job, but she couldn't leave her her, um, her mom alone because she's always in, in the state of anxiety. So one day, she she called me up and she said, "Pete, this this worked." She was, you know, doing all kinds of stuff down around the house. She's talking. I gotta go home. I gotta go home. I gotta go home. She's saying why she has to go home. All these anxious things, and all the daughter did, she went over 
got the tea kettle, put it under this in the sink, filled it up, put it on the stove, went over to the cabinet, got a cup out of the cabinet, put it right by her on the chair, on the um, uh, on the table. She's sitting down now. And she brings up the sugar. She puts the sugar there. And she brings out the little box that has all the teas in it. She puts that there. She goes back two, three more minutes. She gets the key, the, uh, the, the tea kettle. And she starts to pour it. It's whistling at this point. She's pouring it in there. And uh, all of a sudden, there's no more I got to go home. There's no more I got to go home. What is she doing? She's just having tea. That's it. So. It's coming up with a list of you know, some, some tools in the tool bag that you can use that used to give someone comfort. Uh, we do have some folks that, that will, um, at our community, in communities that I've been at, where they, were, um, they, they love to knit. Okay, so this, some, of the, some of our ladies can't knit any longer, but they can take a ball, a ball of yarn and roll it, right? I, don't ask me, my mom used to do it, but roll it, right? Or put it together, make sure it's, uh, it's just as a soothing thing to do. Um, coming up with some ideas of what that might be. Maybe it's music. I'll tell you, at our community, we have music on all day long. You know, sometimes when folks can't say what they need, we have to improvise and fill it in. And sometimes it's two or three things. Maybe it's five or six until we, bam, we, we hit it right on the, we hit the nail on the head like the woman with the tea kettle. Just finding out what it is that they might like. Before someone moves in, we ask a whole bunch of questions of things that they used to like to do, things that bring them comfort, what are some uh, of their favorite foods. You heard me read that little excerpt there of always having snacks on hand. Um, that kind of thing is sometimes helpful always having something available for them. <clears throat> and it might be multiple things. Do you have anything you want to add, Maggie? Can you think of anything? Knowing, um, you know, again, going back to our community, um, is knowing m what makes that person um, excited. Knowing what they did, um, if they're a, a homemaker or if they, um, were a real estate agent or they were a nurse or like they were um, very artsy and crafty, like knowing all that stuff that they loved to do growing up as, an, as, a, as a young adult and an adult, even maybe even as a child, like going back as a child, what they enjoyed doing is very important so we can kind of figure out what's gonna give them happiness because they're gonna be reverting to um, what they like to do or who they were as a younger person. You know, it might just be, a younger adult, or it could be as a child, like who they were and what they like to do, you know, um, as a, a daughter or as a son, um, remembering their life when their mom and dad were taking care of them. So all that stuff is really important. So that's a lot of what we do, um, trying to get more information um, and try to figure out what makes our residents tick. And that's really the key to understanding um, what makes them happy and, and, and where their reality is right now. How big are you? How many residents do you have in your community? 72. Yeah. What's the average length of stay? What would you say the average length of stay is? Mm. Uh, about five years. Five years? I mean, it's less sometimes, sometimes more, but. Um, we do ha we we opened in 2015, and we do have a few people that um, came in 2015. <laughs> it it also it depends. Uh, this is kind of another presentation, but it does depend on the type of dementia. Some dementias are very they progress very rapidly, and others can take years to develop and uh, the trajectory is very slow. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, I understand that not correcting or, you know, when you say incorrect information, how would you handle a situation where others are with you, right? I'll take care of my mom and my dad. Well, constantly, he has a milder form of dementia, but he'll constantly say, you're crazy and stuff like that. And she doesn't really get upset, but, or if other people come to the house and she says something wrong and he'll automatically 
the person who has dementia is correcting or the Yeah, it's tough if you have two folks that have, have dementia, that's a double barrel, right? Yeah, they, so, they both have great sense of humor. yeah there you go. Yeah. So, you know, uh, if certainly if, if it's her husband who has maybe a mild form, you know, that's, that's different. You know, that's kind of go, go with the flow. It's almost like, you know, you can't, you can't, I mean, this, they've been married for how long as well, and so there's some connections there, but for anybody who is going to, um, to correct who, you know, out, outside of that relationship, then it's better just to kind of go with it and say, yeah, I, you know, you're right. Sometimes folks will, uh, will mix up a whole bunch of stories. It might be five or six different trips that you aren't even the trips or and sometimes make up information because part of it is, is could be covering, but also it could be just uh, mixing things up, you know, times and places and events and all of that, and sometimes it's all can be made up. So you just kind of go with it. That sounds very interesting. Tell me more. Go along with it. But in terms of your father, you know, telling him, eh, you shouldn't be doing that, it's probably not gonna, probably not gonna work too well. So just kind of go, let, let them do their thing. And plus, you said that they're uh, there's some there's some humor involved in it, so. The visitors are correcting, right? The yes, visitors, right? So it's right. Might correct. So it's educating yeah. the visitors, yeah. educating. Your, I mean, that's yeah. why we do all this. I mean, that's why we do all this is to educate the general public whether or, whether or not you're a caregiver, you're still going to know someone that has a form of a cognitive impairment or a dementia, Alzheimer's, and so it's educating those people, educating everyone on what dementia is and how to communicate with those people that do have dementia. And so, if they're not educated like you are, then it's up to you and the people that are educated to give them the um, the skinny. a good point which actually uh, if you're looking for for a book if you have um, on your does everybody have a notepad if you have a notepad look on the back of your notepad if you have an X we have this awesome we have this awesome book <laughs> all right is it one X Two X's, oh, okay, well you looked on there. Who has the one X? There's one with two X's and one with one X. There you are. This is a great one. If you, and we can provide this, it's not like you have to win it, like you're gonna win it, and then I can't ever give you one, right? So, but this is um, one that just came out. Brent Forrester, okay, he's, he's uh, an associate with McLean Hospital. Uh, he does presentations for us online on our Zoom. If you go to our website, you're gonna see this uh, this guy, and he's really well well known and well respected. But it's called the Complete Family Guide to Dementia: Everything You Needed to Know to Help a Parent or Yourself. There's one. We have another one. I was gonna say uh, you, there's another book here. Uh, it's more of a it's more of a heartfelt book. That's more of like a how to, you know kind of 101 type of stuff, but this is a chicken soup for the soul for those who are, uh, have you ever read it? It's little short stories. Yeah. Um, they're fun stories uh, to read. Some of them are heartfelt, some of them are really pretty, pretty sad, but also um, heartfelt. Um, we can provide any, any literature you need, but Art had a, uh, a great point that educating your family, give, you know, there's tons of books out there. So, um, Mary had a question. You had a question in the back? Suggestion. suggestion. Uh, my husband wants to always know what's on the schedule for today. Ah. Was he an engineer? <laughs> 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 
Nice. Yes. Yes. Yep. Well, that's that's his go-to, right? That's what works for him, and and it works for many folks. We didn't even cover that in here, but the routine is key. Disruption can be very difficult. Very good point, Mary. There's, you had a question or a comment. Sure. Or answering questions that the people were like, so do I call these people right afterwards and explain the situation? Or how would something like that be handled with people that I don't even know? I think if, did, did the conversation bring her joy? I guess in a certain way. For that very moment? For that moment. Done. Know, I didn't know she was Fine. It's okay. It doesn't matter if you have to explain. <laughs> It, it, I would only explain it to the person if they contacted you and said, you know what, I was worried about your mom. I really was. And then you can, that'll give you your in to explain it. But if it, gives them, if it gives someone joy and they're in the moment, what does it matter if they remember who it is that they're talking to? If it brought them joy, so be it. Um, I had a person who called me up uh, and told me, uh, my mom thinks uh, I'm her her brother, and uh, yeah, that's a problem for me. I don't. I, is this right? And I said, "Well, what were you doing on the phone?" She said, "He said, um, ah, I was. We were laughing about something that happened as a at, when we were kids." I said, "When was the last time your your uh, mom laughed with you?" He said, "A long time ago." I said, "But she was just laughing with you, wasn't she?" But it, I was her brother. Who cares? Who cares? So. Yeah, picking up, we, uh, Mary mentioned something as a strategy that we employed with my mom. Um, and my mom used to have an idea about how her week was going to progress. Um, so we started off with kind of putting in a calendar, you know, so kind of a day by day. But it also led to a level of, you know, adjustment that we had to make. Because the, from what I understand with dementia patients, It worked. It's working. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could change over time, yeah. But it gives her control over visibility. What do I have tomorrow? You know, what do I have today? And these are all good, um, these are all good suggestions, but understand that your loved ones are all different. You're all, all potentially different dementias, different stages, and there isn't, like Pete mentioned, there isn't a one-size-fits-all, so that's why all this is really important information because what works for you may not work for him, but it may work for her. So that's, thank you for that, that's helpful. And we were talking about communication and educating um, um, people to come and visit, neighbors or friends or whatever. We have, I can't remember specifically what it's called, but the index card, so when um, you bring your loved one with dementia out to eat, 
um, and you don't, and they may be acting differently or say things. We actually have like an index card that's, that you can give to the server and say, and it says, oh, you know, don't treat me any differently. I can't remember what it says exactly, but um, I have dementia. I find, uh, you know, I find sometimes have a hard time finding the right words and et cetera, et cetera. And so without having to discuss it in front of your loved one, you can give this card to the server and they can read it and there's no questions at all. And you say the dignity of your wife or your husband or your brother, your sister, your mother, your father. It's just some helpful things that we've found to work for our families. I would I would ask your uh, their doctor if they could do a telehealth, you know, uh, if that works, try it. It might not work. Um, you know, the other thing, you know, for transitions, sometimes it can be difficult. I'm not going to suggest that uh, if it's anxiety provoking any kind of transition, you may want to talk to. And I'm not a doctor, but you may want to talk to your um, physician or her physician about medication that can reduce the anxiety for a PRN, an as-needed medication for travel or to go to a, the primary care physician. Those, you know, if, if, if the primary care physician has to see in, you know, the person in the office, you know, and have an exam or whatnot, sometimes that can be helpful. It's just another tool in the toolbox. I'm not a big proponent of medication, but it does work for some people um, who need it for certain times. Sometimes it's you know has to be given daily as well. It's just one of those tools in the toolbox. Certainly, over medicating is never a good thing. Um, but sometimes that might be a conversation for the doctor. The doctor might have some ideas as well of things because this is not a a novel thing. Many folks with dementia don't like going to doctor's visits. They don't like getting um, showers. They don't like um, to be put into a room with tons of um, stimulation. So these are all things, and so the doctor might have some ideas as well, but you might wanna think about medication uh, just for a PRN, or, you know, to kind of take the edge off, or it might be trying to do that telehealth. Yeah. Not easy. We're, we're almost out of time. We're going to be here for a few minutes, you know. Um, we're so glad you all came. Thanks, Debbie, for coming. Thanks for letting the library have us again. We'll be having the panel next month. Uh, we'll be here for a little bit. Thanks a lot, Go, guys. Thank you.